So welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Geneviève de Blois and I'm very happy to host uh, today's seminars that will feature two presentations about comparative epigenomics from the lab of Dr. Michael Woodson um, in the University of Toronto. So I just want to remind you before we start uh, to type in your questions for the presenters in the chat box during or after their talks. Uh, I'll be able to read the questions to the speakers after the presentation. So our first speaker today is Michael Yang, uh, who recently obtained his PhD in molecular genetics at the University of Toronto under the supervision of Dr. Michael Wilson at the Hospital for Sick Children. Um, his research in the Wilson lab focuses on elucidating the cis regulatory consequences of genetic variation in the context of evolution of human disease. Michael is now looking to transition into a postdoctoral position where he hopes to further explore the interplay between uh, 3D genome architecture and enhancer function in the regulation of developmental and disease processes. So today he will be presenting a talk entitled Enhancer Gene Rewiring in the Pathogenesis of Quebec Platelet Disorder. So Michael. Thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you for the to the organizers for the invitation to present our work today. Uh, so before I begin, I wanna just briefly uh, mention some of the individuals who are involved in this project, which was very much a collaborative effort between multiple labs including uh, Kathy Hayward's lab at McMaster, uh, Jennifer Mitchell's lab here at U of T, as well as my own colleagues from the Wilson lab. And so uh, today I'll be telling you about a disease called Quebec platelet disorder or QPD. And QPD is an autosomal dominant inherited bleeding disorder that affects around one in every two to 300,000 individuals of French Canadian ancestry. And it's characterized by the overexpression of a fibronolytic enzyme, uh, PLOW, specifically in platelets and megakaryocytes. And uh, this overexpression results in a platelet de gain dependent gain of function in fibrinolysis or clot breakdown uh, that results in a high risk of delayed onset bleeding following certain hemostatic challenges. So the mutation responsible for QPD is known. It's a single 78 kilobase tandem duplication of PLOW along with all of its known regulatory elements. However, many of the features of PLOW expression in QPD are inadequately explained by copy number gain alone. Uh, for example, the overexpression of PLOW seen in platelets and megakaryocytes is uh, more than 100 fold above normal, which vastly exceeds what you expect from a 1.5 fold copy number gain. Uh, likewise, this overexpression is highly specific for alleles that originate from the disease chromosome. And again, this, this uh, allele specificity is only seen in platelets and megakaryocytes. And so this leaves us with a very unique case of a disease where we're, we're trying to understand how mechanistically a single tandem duplication can cause such a drastic cell type and allele specific overexpression phenotype. And so to look into this phenotype or this mechanism, we really needed a system that would allow us to study the regulation of PLOW in the context of the QPD mutation and in a system uh, or in a cell type that was reflective of the disease. And so Kathy's lab worked up a system that involved uh, using primary blood samples from QPD and unaffected individuals from which they um, would isolate CD34 positive progenitors and differentiate these uh, in vitro to obtain uh, cultured megakaryocytes as the cell type of primary pathology. And they would also isolate peripheral granulocytes as a lineage match control. And then within these cells, we performed a number of uh, epigenetic-based assays, so ChIP-seq looking at active enhancers as well as repressed regions, uh, as well as assays to give us a sense of the uh, 3D chromatin conformation at the locus. And so looking first at the ChIP-seq data here, uh, I'm showing you the PLOW locus with the region that's tandem duplicated marked in the dash box. Uh, you can see that, uh, for example, in normal megakaryocytes, uh, the PLOW gene body is decorated by K27 trimethyl, the polychrome repressive mark, and, which suggests that PLOW in normal megakaryocytes is actually being actively repressed. However, in QPD, you see that uh, this repression is diminished and consistent with the active expression of PLOW uh, in these cells. 
However, when we try to look for active enhancers to uh, possibly explain this phenomena, uh, what we found was that, in fact, the active enhancer landscape uh, shown by K27 acetyl uh, in QPD and control megakaryocytes sites is actually very similar. We don't see any evidence of reactivation of latent enhancers, for example, those observed in granocytes, nor do we see accumulation of signal at the boundaries of uh, this uh, duplication, which would be the case uh, if the duplication was generating a novel enhancer. But what really uh, caught our attention was this one peak here, uh, which is highly enriched for K27 acetyl and megakaryocytes uh, compared to granocytes, indicating that it could represent a putative megakaryocyte specific enhancer. And the positioning of this peak here is unique in that if you consider the case of a tandem duplication, uh, you actually end up repositioning a copy of PLOW downstream of this enhancer. And this gives us a scenario where perhaps this putative uh, tissue specific enhancer is driving a copy of PLOW to give us the tissue and allele specific expression phenotype that's seen in disease. And so to look further into this mechanism, we ask two questions. First, does, uh, does this putative enhancer function as a true enhancer in megakaryocytes? And second, is this enhancer able to physically engage with the PLOW promoter in QPD? So addressing the first question, we've, we looked at, um, took a closer look at the regulatory properties of this region. So looking in human uh, megakaryocytes and zooming in, you can see that the enhancer is actually bound by many hematopoietic transcription factors that are known to be important for megakaryocyte development as well as gene expression. And taking a look at this orthologous region in a matched cell type for mouse, so with the same CD41 positive uh, marker, you can see that in mouse, this region is also marked by K27 acetyl and also shows evidence of binding of all the same transcription factors seen in human. And all of these uh, features actually localize to a very short 300 base pair or so uh, sequence conserved segment of the enhancer. And when we took this enhancer uh, sequence conserved segment and put it into the zebrafish, we were able to show that it's capable of driving reporter gene expression in regions of the fish that are known to give rise to hematopoietic cells. And furthermore, also showed that um, this enhancer showed co-localized activity with that of hematopoietic transcription factors in the fish. And these all together suggest that enhancer, uh, this uh, putative enhancer it indeed functions as a conserved hematopoietic enhancer. So the next question we want to address was whether or not this enhancer can regulate PLOW uh, in QPD by engaging with the promoter. And uh, as you may know, uh, enhancers engage with uh, gene promoters through the formation of these long range uh, chromatin loops. And the targeting of such loops are, is actually dependent on how the, how the DNA is folded in three dimensional space into the formation of these topically associating domains or TADs, which define uh, inter physically interacting DNA domains in which an enhancer is more likely to find a target receptive promoter within the same domain but not across domain boundaries. And to get a sense of this folding, we turn to uh, chromatin confirmation capture data. So for example, in this uh, high C map here, in this matrix view, these uh, TADs or interacting domains are represented as dark colored uh, squares alongside the diagonal. And in the zoom out view of the plow locus, you can see from the high C contact map that the domain or the locus appears to be divided into two distinct domains. And we can get a closer look at these domain boundaries by looking at uh, the binding of a protein called CTCF, which is known to be bound at and uh, participate in the formation of these boundaries. And from this, uh, we can again see that the locus is split into two distinct domains, one containing PLOW and marked by K27 trimethyl and the other containing our enhancer of interest, the downstream gene BCL, and marked by the active mark K27 acetyl. And these together indicate that perhaps the domain structure at this locus in normal cells is responsible for separating PLOW uh, away from active elements in the region. And what's very interesting is if you look here at the QP duplication, this tandem duplication actually spans the domain 
and repositions a copy of plow outside of the silent domain and into this active domain where it is now able uh, potentially to be regulated by, um, by this enhancer. And we were in fact able to show evidence of this interaction between plow and the enhancer uh, using another assay called 4CC, which uh, lets us uh, inquire about contacts, chromatin contacts originating from a viewpoint of interest. So in this case, I'm showing you contacts from uh, the perspective of the plow promoter. And you can see from the heat map that uh, here in control megakaryocytes, sites, most of the contacts are restricted within the boundaries of this domain. But now if we look uh, in QPD megakaryocytes, you can see that uh, we, you can see evidence of this contact encroaching past the domain boundary and into the area where the enhancer is located. And this interaction uh, is quantified here below. Likewise, uh, if we take the reverse perspective and look from the enhancer point of view, again, in control megakaryocytes, you can see that the interactions from the enhancer perspective uh, sharply drop as soon as you go past this boundary. But again, in uh, QPD megakaryocytes, you can see a clear encroachment of these interactions beyond the boundary into the, uh, into the region where plow is located. And we can take this one step further and look at by looking at SNPs captured within our 4C assay show that similar to what was seen about allele specific gene expression that contacts between um, the enhancer and the plow promoter are highly or significantly enriched for SNPs originating from the disease chromosome. And these all together suggest that the QPD enhancer engages in ectopic and allele specific interactions with the plow promoter in QPD mated carry sites. So putting all these things together, uh, we have our current working model of uh, how um, plow, ex plow overexpression is caused uh, mechanistically in QP. So under normal circumstances, you have plow and you have this megakaryocyte specific enhancer that are kept in two distinct uh, chromatin do domains um, where the domain structure uh, prohibits the enhancer from interacting with plow. In QPD, however, you now, um, the tandem duplication now places a copy of plow uh, downstream of this enhancer within this active domain. And in absence of an intervening boundary element, this enhancer is now free to drive plow expression uh, in the tissue specific and allele specific manner that's seen in disease. So uh, to quickly sum up what I've shown you is that um, we think that Plow overexpression in QPD is caused by this uh, unique mechanism of enhancer hijacking. And with that, uh, it places QPD alongside a small but growing list of human diseases and cancers that are caused by enhancer dysfunction in the context of 3D genome organization. And this appears to be an emerging cause or emer emergently recognized cause of human disease. And together, our work and the work of others really emphasize the need to evaluate these structural variants uh, in the context of tissue-specific genome architecture, as well as tissue-specific enhancer activity when considering the pathogenicity of duplications and other types of structural genomic variants. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank once again all the members uh, who are part of this project. Uh, both uh, members of the Wilson Lab, as well as the QPD team, our funding sources, as well as uh, to say thank you to the anonymous sample donors whose contributions really made this study possible. And I'd be happy to take any questions. All right, thank you very much, uh, Michael, for this very interesting uh, presentation. We have a couple of minutes for questions, so please type in your questions in the in the chat. I'll be able to um, to read them. Uh, maybe I can start with um, uh, maybe a very naive question. You you might have said that, but uh, is is the um, the expression of the gene, the VCL gene, that's in the vicinity of the the DNN, or do you observe a change in this in the expression of this gene in the disease uh, patient? Um, so we don't observe a very large change. There is a very slight increase in VCL expression from an RNA-seq study that we did previously. We do know that VCL uh, is actually turned on very 
uh, very highly during mitocaryocyte development. And that's why we think the enhancer is a driver of BCL. We see a very modest increase in BCL expression, and we think that it might be because you have two copies of the enhancer there, so you have a bit of double dipping. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and you've shown some of the transcription factors that uh, mediate the expression of genes at this enhancer. Um, mm -hmm. have, you, have you looked at whether these are changed in the disease context, or are, is it still the same factors that uh, are recruited there? Right. So we've not looked at the binding of transcription factors at that enhancer in uh, QPD. All of the data that I looked at was from uh, previously published uh, okay. mitocaryocyte data. We do know from RNA-seq that at the very least, uh, the expression of these transcription factors is unchanged. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have a question from uh, Sheila Tibbs. Um, so she says, I'm sorry if I missed this, but does this mean that the gene duplication is not as important as the enhancer rewiring? Uh, yes, uh, we believe that to be the case. Um, also because when you look at sort of the variability of plow expression in the general population, uh, you can see that um, even 1.5 fold is within the range of sort of normal uh, gene expression differences in the population in platelets and megakaryocytes and those individuals don't have the disease. So we do think uh, it is this enhanced rewiring that's really driving the large amount of overexpression and causing the disease phenotype. Okay. Um, we have time for another question. Um from Bill Stanford, uh, are other loci within the affected pad also overexpressed on only, or is it only plow? So from what we can see, um, we only see a plow to be very highly overexpressed. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there is a bit of increase in expression of the VCL gene, which is downstream, and we think that's, that may be due to double dipping of the enhancer activity with VCL. There's also an antisense gene uh, or antisense transcript uh, alongside PLOW, uh, but we don't see increase in the expression of that. So it's really specifically PLOW that's being upregulated here. Okay. Um, we'll take one last question from uh, Julie Lessard. Do you see a change in chromatin accessibility of the enhancer in the disease context in ATAXIC? So we uh, attempted to do a TAC early on. We, we never ended up um, doing a TAC in the sort of end stage uh, cultured megakaryocytes, and partly because this uh, material is primary patient material and it's very hard to come by. Um, we know that the enhancer increases in accessibility during megakaryocyte development, but um, I don't believe we did that comparison looking at accessibility between disease and control states. Uh, I, I can tell you that after correcting for copy number change that the amount of K27 acetyl at that enhancer doesn't change. So forever, whatever that's worth, yep. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. So um, so we'll, we're gonna go to the next uh, speaker, uh, which is the... Uh, Michael Wilson, Dr. Michael Wilson. So uh, after obtaining his PhD in molecular evolution and immunology in the group of Ben Cook at the University of Victoria, Dr. Wilson trained as a postdoctoral fellow in regulatory genomics in Duncan Odom's lab at Cancer Research UK Cambridge Institute at the University of Cambridge. He then joined the University of Toronto, where he is now a senior scientist at the Hospital for Sick Children and an associate professor in the Department of Molecular Genetics. Dr. Wilson holds a Canada Research Chair in Comparative Genomics and leads a research group that uses gen uh, genomic uh, technologies, multi-species comparison, bioinformatics and molecular biology to uncover gene and genome regulatory mechanisms that are relevant to developmental and disease processes. By comparing epigenetic regulation between species, his team is uncovering fundamental mechanisms of genome regulation. So today, Dr. Wilson will be presenting a talk entitled Acute Inflammation, a Comparative Epigenomic Perspective. 
Thank you very much, Genevieve, um, and for, for the organizers for the invitation to speak. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so um, to, to begin here, just to set the stage, um, acute inflammation is an evolutionarily conser conserved process. Um, it's a natural response to insult and injury. So it's also obviously involved in many different types of disease, um, inflammatory disease, cancer, cardiovascular disease, and so on. Um, to illustrate this, I'm, it's almost canoe camping season again. So I like to, to look at this reminder of my first trip. I was, I guess, a year and a half, like last year, or the year before last year, actually, with my son on his first trip where he got a stick in the eye and this was the immediate response. We have also the deer flies biting and again, a natural response to, a, to an exogenous stimulus. Now, what can we learn about comparative, um, what can we learn about acute inflammation and that process, that conserved process, if you will, from comparative uh, genomics. And there's been a lot of interest, there's obviously a lot of interest in this from disease modeling perspective. And there's also, depending on how you ask the question and how the experiment is designed, you can come up with some very different answers. For example, here, this first study created a lot of uh, attention looking at the, how well the mouse models um, recapitulate the human inflammatory disease um, using the same data, another group followed up becoming to the um, precisely opposite conclusion. Um, and after a lot of back and forth, this was all at um, PNAS journal, um, there was sort of a, a, a nice sort of happy medium that was reached here, which I, I agree with um, quite a lot. I fully agree with that when looking at inflammation or in any process in particular, um, the models can be good, but it really um, requires one to set things up so we can compare apples to apples, if you will. And so of course, there's a, there's a lot of challenges to studying a process which has evolved in some cases, but in many cases, the logic has remained conserved. So this sets the stage for uh, the work that we're doing. And so to set up this apples to apples comparison, we, had to, we wanted to do this. We wanted to compare acute inflammation between species. And the first decision we wanted to do is how are we gonna learn about inflammation? Um, and there was a very easy answer, easy at least in terms of nominating this, this uh, perspective. And the perspective we wanted to take was this transcription factor complex called NF-kappa beta. NF-kappa beta is, is a master regulator of transcription. Um, it's um, it, it works as a dimer. There's many, there's, a, there's different subunits. The, the, the predominant subunit that I'll talk about today and the one that is um, often studied, but it's not the only one. Um, this this uh, subunit with uh, P65 and P50, uh, um, also P65 is also known as RELA um, and NFKB1 is the P50 heterodimer. So this, this um, transcription factor is a great, um, if you wanted to follow and look in the genome of where places where inflammation is getting read out, uh, NF-kappa beta could, could guide you there. Um, the stimulus, there's different stimuli that can invoke um, um, NF-kappa beta binding the genome, but the one that we're gonna focus on today is TNF-alpha. TNF-alpha can bind its receptor and through this binding, a set of a, a very well characterized set of events can occur whereby the repressor of NF-kappa beta will get degraded NF-kappa beta as a, a P65 um, NF-kb1 uh, heterodimer will go into the nucleus and it will bind um, regions in the genome and, and invoke an, a rapid gene expression. Now this, this um, NF-kappa beta, we're coming at this rather new, like this has been very well studied. The last, this is a 30 year commemory article that was just published a few years back. And really um, from all we know about transcription factors, NF-kappa beta is a very, uh, canonical, a very a perfect example of this um, dynamic, uh, th this uh, in inducible transcription factor where it could go from latency, can be induced, it invokes its response, there's, and then there's a quick resolution so one can go back to normal. This is exactly what you'd want from a, a transcription factor that's regulating in part acute inflammation. And so one of the questions, this goes back sort of to the general area in, 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 the, in the epigenetics and, and comparative genomics, um, there's a large interest in understanding what are the actual elements in the genome that control um, any kind of any physiological process um, development, disease and, or inflammation in this case. And so you can break this down if you wanna understand it from a transcription factors perspective. There is some questions about where would it bind? Now, if we were to use the canonical NF-kappa beta motif or it's a well-characterized half site, um, we'd find there's about 2 million of those binding sites in the genome. Um, but if we do the experiments, the published experiments, you're typically getting the order of tens of thousands of, of um, relay binding peaks, for example. So places where relay can bind reproducibly. Um, and if we look at the actual response, which ultimately is what we want to study, um, we're, get, we're on the order of a thousand target genes. 
Um, whereas there's, there's um, almost 10,000 genes, and like most genes in the genome will have a Raleigh binding peak nearby. So with that in mind, we set out with this great collaboration with Jason Fish's lab and my uh, graduate student, Azad Alazada, together with uh, Jason's graduate student, Nadia Kaiser. Azad's now a, a PhD student in Greg Cannon's lab. Nadia is doing a postdoc in Steve Hanikoff's lab. Um, we worked together um, on this collaboration to, to look at a comparative um, epigenomic um, analysis of NF-kappa beta and also thereby studying acute inflammation. And this work was done and set up by others in my lab. So Lena and, and Alejandra set the system up and um, had worked it out before Zad joined. And, and we joined forces with uh, Liang Shi, Rathna, and Mingao, as well as um, work that I won't get to talk to today, a, new, a collaboration that's emerging with, or it's ongoing with Shishmita Roy, Jennifer Mitchell, and others. So with that, let me tell you about the system we wanted to focus on. And this, um, we could have chosen many different cell types um, to study NF-kappa beta. Um, binding to the genome and acute inflammation. We chose endothelial cells. Um, endothelial cells um, are essential frontline, um, are essential in orchestrating response to injury and insult. Um, they, they make good use of the P65 NFKB1, so it was a good system to choose. Um, and in response to um, stimulus, their job will be to recruit um, monocytes um, to, to, this, uh, to the blood, uh, to the blood um, cell wall. Um, and their job is, for example, to secrete cytokines like CCL2, which I'll come back to later in a moment, actually. So the system is, this is the best, we, we took some time to set this up. This is our apples to apples, the best that we could do. We were able to obtain primary aortic endothelial cells from three different species. So the anatomical location is roughly matched. We could attain the stimulus, so we could attain species-specific peptide, um, um, TNF-alpha for each of the three species. Um, they're roughly equidistantly in, in terms of evolution. They're of a similar evolutionary distance to the three species. And then we profiled um, NF-kappa beta binding through RELA. We also profiled some, some epigen epigenetic marks, which I won't talk about too much today, some um, post-translational histone modifications. And more importantly, and what we made good use of is the chromatin accessibility, um, in addition to RNA expression assays, which I'll mention. And so the experiments were done really, we wanted to really look at the initial response. So we're talking about stimulus 45 minutes later, that's given an NF kappa beta enough time to get into the nucleus and we were able to take a snapshot of what happened. And so just to, I'm gonna go through this rather quickly just to say that before stimulus, we get very few binding events. After stimulus, in the case of human, we optimized the assay, we got about 60,000 events. We had to use dual cross-linking to capture this NF kappa beta properly. Um, and in mouse, um, similar, we got a large increase, although different number and same with cow. Um, the attack seek um, numbers are, uh, the attack seek numbers here are, they didn't change much as we would expect after 45 minutes with and without stimulus. Um, and overall, just to sort of get in a sense of how conserved is this response? How often do we have a conserved orthologous um, NF kappa beta binding, uh, binding event? There's about one third of the human elements had a binding event in the orthologous location in one or more species. If we are being super strict to have the same event in an orthologous within an orthologous location in all three species, we're down to about 5,000 elements. So these elements are of great interest and we really wanted to use this framework to study NF-kappa beta response more. So the first thing that the ZAD did was make this some simple, simple plots here where we've broken out the number of species NF-kappa beta binding event is conserved in. So three means conserved orthologous binding in three species, the darkest blue. And we look to see, okay, what about the signal intensity of Raleigh? And you can see the most conserved ones have the strongest um, signal um, in terms of the Raleigh binding, also in terms of chromatin accessibility. We used, um, we looked for intronic RNA. We used, uh, looked at the sort of nascent, looked at RNA-seq data, looking at the ratio of intronic RNA to exonic RNA to get a sense of some putative target genes. Many of these make good sense based on what we're, the system we're studying, CCL2 again, um, and others, E-selectin. We can get the target genes and we can, this is a sanity check. We would expect this, and we saw this, that conserved um, genes which are induced by, relic, by TNF alpha have more conserved binding events near them. Um, so that's good. So things are working. Um, we wanted to go a little bit further. And so we employed um, a chromatin run-on assay. It's, we use this a protocol from the Denko lab called CrowSeq. And what it can do is it can look at nascent RNA. And so I'll just draw your attention to this enhancer here. Um, Bidirectional transcription that occurs here, these are unstable RNAs. 
that can be detected with CrowSeq, that's an indic indicative of an active enhancer. Um, it might look like this on the genome browser. So we use this assay um, in, in a immortalized endothelial cell. And then we took our annotations to see, like our conserved annotations, to see how does conservation correspond to enhancer activity um, and as measured by CrowSeq. And you can see the darker blue here, that's the, there's more, bi this is bi-directional transcription. There's more of it in the conserved ones relative to um, the species specific events. Um, and to go a little bit deeper, and I'll just pause for a moment just to, just to discuss this, because we were, we're, all, we're very interested in how TF transcription factor binding works. And so we wanted to break down the categories a little bit. So we broke it down here, the, the 5,000 5, events that are shared in all three species, these that have the strongest enhancer activity. If we took the same number, so 5,000 of our relay binding sites and ranked them by their, their evolutionary constraint using a GURP score, this is the signal that we get down here. It's no different than the, the average of all the relay sites. So in fact, the actual conservation of the sequence doesn't matter so much as the conservation of the protein DNA interactions. And another feature to note is that even just by ranking the top um, 5,000 sites by intensity, we actually see some, some decent um, correlation with the activity of the enhancer. And just to note that this ranking chip seek peaks doesn't work for every factor. We did the same thing in liver previously and noted that the, the most likely liver enhancers that we found were not the strongest ones. And this is typical of developmental enhancers. So I just wanted to point that out here. So we can look across species. We can also look across different cell types for which NF-kappa beta has been measured. And so the ones which actually get bound in the same location in different cell types are probably more likely to be part of the NF-kappa beta response. And those would be our pan cell ones. And we can see, in fact, the types of enrichment that we get with Go for those are um, related to immune response. Whereas the ones that are private to endothelial cells here, we actually see they are related to processes that we might expect from endothelial cells, blood cell morphogenesis and angiogenesis. So again, partitioning across species and across tissues could um, give us information about which binding events we might want to study further. Um, and if we take the idea of like, if you're bound in four species like this, this event here near, near the inhibitor of NF-kappa beta, um, those events are actually more than half of those are conserved in one or more species, which suggests that they're more functional. Um, and so then we took a deep dive, and this is for the, this audience at the Epigenomic Consortium. I, I'm, I'm not indulging myself here. I'm hopefully I'm gonna, I'm gonna be able to explain this um, so it makes sense. Um, we want to look at chromatin accessibility as well as NF-kappa beta binding. And so what you would normally expect is there's an already an accessible region here, NF-kappa beta hops in and binds. This is, um, sorry, this is the one right here. So it's already open before stimulus, after stimulus, and there's binding event after stimulus. Um, in some cases, the chromatin can open like these ones. Um, and in other cases, um, and this is something that I wanna focus on for the rest of the talk. Some cases we saw robust binding without the concomitant um, increase or apparent increase in chromatin accessibility. We call these mode C or closed sites. We also found some where NF-kappa beta was hanging out in advance. So these are, we're gonna call them pre-bound sites. And I'm gonna focus the next few slides discussing those. Um, so this is just breaking on the number. The closed sites are not just a random number. There's about 20,000 of the peaks would fit in within this category. So we wanted to dive in further using comparative epigenomics. Using a tax seek, we can infer nucleosome positioning. And this is just to show you that in dark blue here, those are the closed sites. The closed sites don't have um, chromatin accessibility, uh, appear to be nucleosome occluded. The ones that open up after, you can see the dip in nucleosome occupancy, suggesting our categories are meaningful. And contrast, these prebound sites have, are really nucleosome depleted, as a tax seek would indicate. We looked at other people's data sets using MNAs as well as DNAs. And just to say that the mode C sites, even if we were to use MNAs and HUVEC, look to be more nucleosome occluded um, compared to the sites that are considered open, um, like the mode O sites, which have the nucleosome depletion. So it seems robust. We looked at this in different cell types, even with different NF-kappa beta subunits. So um, it seems to be a robust feature here. And just to describe it a little further, we want to ask about that motif. So NF-kappa beta loves to bind this canonical motif. The pre-bound sites have a lot, more than half, of, almost half of the peaks will have a, a recognizable central NF-kappa beta motif in them, in those sites. But not far behind are those, those mode C, the closed sites, as well as the sites that the chromatin opens after. So these look like they're probably motif driven. Um, if we count the number of motifs, these mode C sites have more motifs within the peak compared to the, the general um, open chromatin bound NF-kappa beta sites. So again, this looks like whatever we're seeing here is not just a, like a chip seek 
artifact, but rather it has something to do with the motif. Um, so with this, we want to take this idea of modes and take it one step further in terms as a comparative genomics um, perspective, from a comparative genomics perspective. Now, just going to keep an eye on the time here. Um, so what we've done is we've actually not just asked, is the peak conserved between species? So here's the relay peak. We also want to know, is the mode conserved? So if you're a mode oocyte in human, how often are you also a mode oocyte, like an, an open chromatin bound in other species? And same for the mode C site. So is this binding to inaccessible or nucleosome occluded chromatin a feature that's conserved between species? This sums up the analysis and I just wanna highlight a couple of things from here. So the short um, summary is that modes are often conserved um, in case like if you're mode oocyte, there's 71% of the time we saw it as being modo and one of the other species. Um, similar to the mode C sites, we saw more than half of those were also considered a conserved mode C site, which suggests that this mode of regulation has been conserved and speaks against an artifact type of observation with these, these constitutively closed sites. Um, next slide. And then we wanted to look back at sort of some functional properties of these regions. So the dotted line here is if we just take the, 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 the whole category of the mode P sites, the prebound sites, or if we want the prebound sites to also be conserved in another species, this shows you that those ones that have conserved modes have stronger, uh, that are more open, have more RLA binding, and have more of this H3K27 acetylation mark, which is an indicator of an active enhancer. So those are all sort of proxies for function or functional, um, suggest functionality of enhancers if you're um, looking at it from the epigenome perspective. When we look at it from a, from a, a, a go enrichment perspective, the mode P sites enrich again for these immune functions. That's like that one that I showed you there for, for NFKBI, the inhibitor of NF kappa beta, but also even the mode C sites, which you might think to be depleted of function just because of the nature of their binding, in fact, are related to um, processes that are relevant to endothelial cell biology, and as you'll see in a moment, inflammation. So it seems to be a meaningful criteria classifying NF kappa beta by its epigenetic mode. Um, so how, do this, how does this relate to inflammatory gene expression? Now, one thing that's been well established by many groups um, is that a lot of the really big gun enhancers such as CCL2, it was a, a, a well-studied enhancer by Bing Ren and many others, this is, are actually found, are actually involve clusters of enhancers. So there's several enhancers in, in a location. These are also called super enhancers. Um, so a lot of the inflammation works, in fact, by having many enhancers that bind NF-kappa beta, which in, in, it's just believed to and shown to you by other like, people like Susan Mandrup's lab to sequester um, cofactors and able to kind of hijack the cell to drive this inflammatory response to steal from these beautiful pristine developmental enhancers here, for example. Um, so when we rank our, when we kind of classify the enhancer clusters using this ROSE analysis, the, the, the largest and the strongest or the biggest cluster with the most um, signal of NF-kappa beta um, binding or RLA binding is CCL2. It's a similar in mouse. And so we can classify super enhancers by species and then compare them as well. Um, and just to highlight here that within the super enhancers, we see more of these mode P sites. So these super strong single enhancers, like this, I like to think of an enhancer as a single event. These ones actually live more often within super enhancers. Also, these mode C sites, so those inaccessible or nucleosome occluded sites, are also found more often in super enhancers. And in fact, one third of the binding events within a super enhancer, um, when we classify them by relay signal, are these mode C sites, which is more than you'd expect by chance. We're not the first people to observe this binding to the nucleosome. It's not often talked about because typically we look at accessible chromatin as places where um, transcription factors bind. Um, but it has been noted, and there's some good literature on this, just to highlight. I just want to make that fact clear that we're not the first to see this. Um, and if we want to put together a very simple model, the, the NF kappa beta dynamics is beautiful. There's um, a lot of awesome work out there, mathematical models describing it. This, this really crude cartoon of ours is just to highlight how could mode C sit in with, with sit within the model because this so far has not been incorporated into the models of NF kappa beta binding. And so what we think is that NF kappa of uh, these mode C sites have a beautiful NF kappa beta motif. It's presented in the context of a nucleosome. So it's not as accessible. It doesn't bind as quickly, but this allows under high concentrations of NF kappa beta, this sort of private parking space for Rale which when the concentrations get degraded, um, get, get lowered by the degradation of, NF, of the movement of NF-kappa beta out of the nucleus, 
then they will release NF kappa beta. And so this allows us to have these sort of super enhancers which can form and fall apart quickly. So I'd be happy to discuss this model um, further. This is a paper a colleague sent to me this morning, which I fully haven't processed yet, but actually looks at the system in a much more sophisticated way. So I'm just flagging this for everyone. The Hoffman lab has, um, has came out today. And so they actually looked at oscillations in regards to the response. And I haven't fully, I, I'm, and we're looking at a simple system with the stimulation, but there's obviously more to the picture here. But I think mode C sites fit squarely within there. So if I have time to end the talk, I just want to talk about a bit of functional follow-up that we've done. Um, just checking here. Oh, yeah, I think so we got just enough here. So CCL2 is that top super enhancer that we saw. If we look at it from our data point of view, it is indeed bound by multiple rel -A's. There's multiple NF kappa beta binding sites here. If we line them up between species, they're oft, most of these are shared between human, mouse, and cow. There's one region here which has been associated with a variety of diseases through different GWAS studies. There's a SNP there that's been functionally studied to be a potentially causal SNP and this, this, um, this, uh, within this enhancer. And so what we did and really what was driven by Nadia in Jason's lab was we went and we went to this immortalized karyotypically normal telo, um, aortic endothelial cell and we made deletions of enhancers one, two, three, and four, the block of those one to four as well as enhancer six. And the short story is that Deleting enhancer six kills this entire super enhancer. The, the gene expression after TNF alpha stimulation is, is um, negligible. The other enhancers one, two, and three seem to have additive effects. So they're having much smaller, but, but um, significant effects on the expression. This one seems almost to have the, be somewhat of a repressor. And even the deletion of all four of those doesn't add up to the deletion of one of these. And this is the one that has the GWAS um, uh, variant that's been studied. We, Nadia studied this further by replacing the relay motifs within this one GWAS containing region, GWAS SNP containing region. And by taking out the relay sites, we then we again also tune the response to um, TNF alpha stimulation. So it's not all about relay here, just to be clear, but relay, the, 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 the actual um, binding event of kappa beta through this enhancer is playing a major role in CCL2 expression, which is a major um, factor for um, response to to injuries in the, in the blood vessel wall. So finally, we wanted to extend this to all the SNPs that we could find. So we worked with Matt Weirich here, who has a, a approach um, called RELI, which is, which is this, uh, a, a well thought out way to take a list of your favorite regions. In this case, it was our NF kappa beta regions that were classified by those categories. We went against the GWAS catalog and we wanted to see what, if we hit any certain regions that um, uh, tag SNPs and the SNPs that were in LD with those whether, what, what do we find? To what extent does conservation, what extent does having a binding event of multiple tissues um, you know, inform us or potentially inform us of genetic variation that's observed and the phenotypes associated with it. And so this is just an example. If we take our conserved relay peaks, the 5,000 of them, we end up seeing more, by, we, see, we see overlap of those peaks with diseases which are related to chronic inflammation than we'd expect by chance, as well as several other diseases um, we, we end up seeing an enrichment for like for psoriatic arthritis. There's not many hits, but we, 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 we found some overlap within those. And so all of these re would re require much more work. In total, about um, 3,000 of these notes fell within 2,000 peaks and half of those almost were conserved. Um, we've broken this down. I won't go through this heat map, but just to show you, for example, the three species conserved regions have some hits within stroke, for example. And so really the next steps is going to be to dig in like we did for CCL2 um, to start to understand the mechanism here. And I know others in the community like Guillaume Letra has some beautiful assays set up to start to interrogate things like this. And I think in the future, I hope what we've done here is by using a comparative epigenomic approach, we've annotated um, acute inflammation in the field cells, much of which could actually pertain to other cell types. We've highlighted regions that would warrant future functional study by virtue of their evolutionary conservation, the mode, the epigenetic status before and after stimulation. Um, and we began to test a couple of these regions, which clearly we need to scale up um, if we want to make more progress with that. Um, and so it's also interesting to note that this binding of transcription factors to, 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 to nucleosome occluded chromatin, what um, seems to be a, a prevalent mode of, of the acute inflammatory response, and it's consistent with the thermodynamic model of gene expression. So with that, I'd really like to thank the lab. This is the longest going project in the lab, again, started by Alejandra and Lena, championed by Azad, together with Nadia and Jason Fish's lab. 
Um, and then many others like um, have come, Dale's working, he's got some fantastic work from this project. Rathna did all the crow seek that you saw. Mengao did some 4C seek that you didn't see and so on. There's many others involved here and we're also um, excited to further explore this and I'd love to hear any questions if there's still time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Michael, for this uh, very interesting presentation. Um, so we have a couple of questions that are uh, starting to show up in the chat. I'm going to start uh, with, the, with the quick questions about the different modes that you presented. Um, what do you think, or maybe you've discussed that and I missed it, but what do you think defines the, the mode of regulation of a specific site? Do, is there something in the in the chromatin around or epigenetic regulation that changes it? Or is there any other binding sites around that could contribute to the different mode of actions? That's a fantastic question. To, I'm gonna to try to organize my, my answers on that because certainly the chromatin does matter. One thing I didn't mention, like I'll just focus on the, the more mysterious ones, these mode C sites, ones that we seem, seem to have in a uh, nucleosome occluded regions. Most of those good ones are found within regions we would call H3K27 acetylation positive. So there, there are nucleosomes there, but they're within a larger peak of H3K27 acetylation, if you will. So I think these regions have to be accessible. The chromatin, there has, the chromatin has to be visible still to NF-kappa beta. So that's one thing. It seems counterintuitive. It's an active enhancer mark with nucleosome occlusion. Again, just to remember that the that we're looking at a bulk chip seek assay. So it's still possible that, you know, for a split second, you have the chromatin is actually accessible at that time. But we've looked also at four hours and we don't see a gradual opening of these sites. So it's not like a pioneer factor. So we can say that we see MNAs, all the DNAs, the assays are consistent. So I don't think it can be simply explained, even if we normalize for signal intensity, the similar intensity of an open chromatin site of Relay to a closed one, we still don't see any blip of a taxi. So it looks like it's real. Um, so again, there's something that the motif matters a lot. So NF-kappa beta does like to bind its motif. It's very well established. Having more of those motifs, um, I think really matters. So that's, and that of course has an effect on what the DNA shape would be and everything else. So the okay. motif matters and other factors like Jun are present um, um, often. And so other TFs absolutely matter. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. That leads me to another short question, maybe. Um, do you think that this mode of regulation can be changed in a disease context um, within an answer or a regulatory site, for example, in cancer development could adopt a different mode of uh, activation? Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's another fantastic question. Um, so, the, it's well known by um, actually the paper I just highlighted today from the Hoffman group, as well as um, Natoli's group and, and any others that after inflammation, there's an epigenetic memory and Atsuni et al. call it the epigenetic scar. So when you have these active um, marks, we didn't do a temporal analysis, but some of these will become, they will be um, labeled, um, if you will, you'd have a K4 monomethyl there now, which means the next time the response can happen quicker. So, and I think there's other ways like this, uh, there's other factors that could change the response for the long haul. And I, I mean, this Hoffman work actually is what I'm, I'm digging in today. It's opening my mind to some things that I hadn't thought about, um, but there's a, a rich amount of literature there, but it's absolutely true that there is a change of states that could happen during chronic inflammation and in cancer. And it's, it has to do with the dynamics of the NF kappa beta in and out of the nucleus. So we didn't okay. get there, but I, I wanna get, I need to read more about that too. Okay, great. Thank you. So we have a question from uh, Carolyn Brown. Um, she says, thanks for the clear and interesting talk. Um, inflammation is different in males and females. Were your evolutionary studies in one or both sexes? So that's another important question. So we, we, this is, this is, um, so we did our experiment. Um, now, in humans, our experiment were done in, in males. We were able to get male mice. We had to have cut, like we, were, we weren't making all our aortic endothelial cells, so we were limited. Um, the, the cow and the bovine endothelial cells, um, we didn't have a say in their sex. Um, so that's there's there's that's some of the dirty secrets. The mouse and the human are male, um, and a lot of this had to do with our budget and, uh, and our time. But um, we've actually got some funding to do males and female humans from CERC, which we're still doing. I hope the money is still there because I do think we need to look at it at least in human and both sexes. 
Um, so we, aren't, we're, we can't speak to that any further, Carolyn, but it's clearly there will be differences. We don't have the power to talk about it. So we really just look for the, I would say these are probably mostly pan, um, like they're, they're probably relevant for both sexes, the most the conserved ones, but that doesn't mean um, that we shouldn't look. We need to look, um, we are doing this, but we don't know now. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, next question from KJ Aitken. Great talk. If chronic disease tissue have uh, repeated TNF exposure, could you speculate on what repeated exposure to TNF might do to the NF kappa B binding and chromatin accessibility? So I think uh, I would speculate, I'll try to keep this answer short because I, there is um, better models to study this um, phenomena. I know Myron Solbolski, we're working with him on a study that tries to look at this much more clearly. Um, but I would say just from a, a typical point of view, we, we, if we were to re-expose some of these cells again to inflammation, um, the sites that were open already are gonna open more quickly. So I think you would end up having some sites that are hyperactive, but there also could be downregulation too. And so I don't wanna make this answer too simple because I, I do, um, there's, this is actually a really tricky answer, a question to answer clearly here. So I would say that um, our study didn't address this, um, but there will be different epigenetic changes after simulation. So you will get more rapid response in some cases, but there can be attenuation of other responses um, that means that some genes might not be as, as inflamed after the next stimulus. So sorry to hand wave. I think the, like the Hoffman's, if you go to his lab webpage, you'll see that there's a lot of work on this. Um, thank you for the question though. Okay, thank you. Um, and one question from Eric Campos. Um, great talk. Are there certain non nf kappa b transcription factor binding sites or motifs that tend to neighbor the nf kappa b target sites that follow different modes? So the one binding site that um, we studied the most here and others have studied, the half site of nf kappa b is also a very nice ETS motif and the ERG, the ERG factor likes to bind it. And so by studying our modes, and looking at ERG binding, um, Casey Romanowski's lab has done ERG binding in, in Hayox with and without inflammation. And so she'd already mapped this response. So we took her data um, and we looked to see how that corresponded to modes. And it was actually quite interesting. So if we looked at the EC, the endothelial cell specific regions that got inflammation, um, ERG binding on those could actually be synergistic. So you may actually have more, more like they might be, you'll end up having a higher ERG signal. But in other cases where the, on the pan cells that the ERG binding sites, the ERG would actually go down. So the idea would be NF kappa beta is out competing ERG in the sort of sequestration model. So depending on the different modes, you might have a competition scenario like these kind of, a lot of the ERGs, a lot of NF kappa beta goes to developmental endothelial cell enhancers that would be bound by ERG. There's going to be some competition there where ERG, uh, ERG gets released and the, and the other factors that regulate gene expression like B, um, um, BRD4, they can be liberated to go help the inflammatory genes. This is my sort of cartoon world here. So there's a competition, but there's also synergy too. And the modes actually help you separate that. So ERG is a big one. Jun's the other one, which we studied together, but I didn't talk about today, um, that also play together. But there's a direct sort of, it looks like a competition with ERG and um, Rale that actually warrants further study with more with assays that look for co-binding and stuff. Yeah, thanks, Eric. That's a great question. Very interesting. Thank you. I uh, would like to thank again both speakers uh, today for their very interesting talks. And um, I would like to remind everyone that we're going to take a break for the summer. We'll be back in September with the Cirque uh, seminar series. With this, thank you again to both speakers.